Are you seeing my title screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. I'm going to turn off my video just to uh, say damn it. Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, people asked me to talk today about sort of exascale ambition for SPH in engineering. So, uh, I'm going to cover a few topics. So it perhaps might be a bit controversial, might stoke some discussion afterwards, I hope. So my talk is split into three um, sections. One is sort of SPH for engineering. Second one is uh, real engineering problems, although we've just heard some very nice examples from, from George and from, from Brendan on that. And I will just sort of highlight some wicked problems that, that I'm sort of interested in. Um, and then I'm going to say why exascale is actually not straightforward for SPH in engineering. And I will highlight what uh, we, we know as the spheric grand challenges and also uh, what, how these sort of translate to exascale. So this is my original motivation for SPH. On the left, you can see uh, a broken wave at a beach. I'll actually come back to this at the end, but you can see this is highly rated swash zone. We've got a plunging wave here. We've got a splash up with lots of bubbles and things like that. On the right hand side here, this is actually a lighthouse being impacted by a wave. And then this is a, a wave energy device. And SPH has some distinct advantages in simulating these, these simulations, these uh, applications over other methods, which is why I was interested in it. So this is the sort of the, the classical, a classical example. This is just the uh, tsunami overtopping the defense in 2011 in Japan. And you can see that some of the vehicles get tossed around uh, like toys. Um, and then we can actually do this in SPH relatively straightforwardly. This was done by my colleagues at the University of Vigo in, in Spain. And you can see the fluid structure interaction there is actually relatively straightforward. We don't have to work very hard to do that. So uh, actually, I think no talk today has actually said what SPH is and um, uh, any idea about the method. So I, I didn't think I'd get the opportunity to say that today, but here we are. Um, so it is, of course, a meshless method. Um, our computation points are particles that move, okay, according to the governing dynamics. So mainly for us, it's going to be the fluid mechanics and Navier-Stokes equations, and we move them along a trajectory by integrating in time, their velocity and acceleration. They possess properties that they carry with them that can stay constant or they vary with time. But the heart of the method is this um, uh, summation of interparticle interactions in this, what I call a radius of influence. So around a particular particle, these particles interact with this particle, but those outside that radius of influence do not interact. And so we sum up the contributions of all the neighbors of this particular particle inside that radius of influence. Now that's one of the things that makes SPH very um, uh, robust and actually very interesting as, as a method. For us as engineers, the main points are that in fact, we don't have to treat the free surface. And in fact, there's no expensive meshing. I noticed with the presentation from Rolls-Royce that meshing was, was mentioned there and that's actually, it can be an expensive process, so we don't we don't worry about that. And because SPH is meshless and Lagrangian, we actually capture many of these nonlinearities inherently. We don't have to work very hard to get those nonlinearities. So, what's our overall aim? Well, we're trying to create state-of-the-art SPH software to fulfill several objectives. So we want to create SPH software that's useful for engineers, industry, and fundamental research. But because we're working in engineering, it's got to be validated. And this is really important. And we have to use really quite rigorous uh, estimates of error and things like this, so the L2 error norm convergence. Ideally, we want this to be open source um, so that it's open to researchers to uh, uh, improve and expand. And I've grayed out number four here because uh, we try to make it as accessible as possible without really the need for HPC systems. However, there are some applications where HPC is absolutely essential. And we also want it to be easy to use for applications with different physics. And, and that's a really challenging part of what we do. 
So part of what our, our work is developing an SPH code and open source. This is called Jules Physics. And this is highly parallelized. We made the decision probably 12 years ago to use NVIDIA GPUs because at the time they were um, significantly further ahead than other technologies. Um, and so we've been using them ever since. And now we can do simulations of up to sort of 80 million particles on a, on a single GPU. So this is open source. Uh, software is available for free, it's highly collaborative, and we can do lots of things with it, which I'll just show in a second. It's a, a multi institution project. We've got six institutions really so, University of Vigo in Spain, Manchester, we have Lisbon, we have the University of Parma in Italy, we have uh, UPC in Barcelona, and the New Jersey Institute of Technology, and then we have lots of other collaborators uh, around that. So we try as much as possible to apply it to real problems. So this is um, the, the Wavestar energy device uh, just here on the top right, where you can see a lot of fluid structure interaction. And then this is obviously a sort of an aquaplaning uh, simulation in the bottom. And so this is really our aim to try and produce a, a, an engineering tool that can be useful for engineers to, to analyze some of their, their problems. Okay. So let's now have a little bit of think about real engineering problems and why exascale is needed and, uh, and actually what, what are the challenges in, in getting there? Uh, you might think it's easy, but actually it's not. So real engineering problems are three dimensional and this has quite an important consequence in that the number of particles that we need to use then ends up being very, very large. So we did a billion particle simulation uh, what, nearly 10 years ago now of a, a wave striking an offshore uh, platform. And this really just demonstrated that real engineering problems need a very large number of particles. In fact, in order to do this properly, this application properly, which we didn't, we actually need a very fine resolution in certain areas of the domain in order to capture the right uh, physics in, uh, in those uh, parts of the, the application. So even when you've got variable resolution or variable particle sizes, this, the number of particles that are required is, is enormous. Now acting over a very large number of scales, okay. So an SPH code should be able to scale on petaflop HPC systems and we can do that uh, these days, but obviously we have to have an eye open for, for excess scale and this might require a bit of a rethink of how we do things. So I want to just go through two or three wicked applications, I've called them, of things that are very difficult. We've heard a few. Um, this is one of my favorites. So this is actually just a breaking wave at a beach. I, I showed it to you earlier, but let's just think about the complexities for a second. So first of all, okay, the waves are propagating and they are propagating quite often, anything between 10, 100 or even a thousand kilometers before they get to the beach and before they break. Okay, so we've already got a long distance and a long time propagation. Then the wave breaks and it breaks in a very, very short distance at the shoreline. You know, it can be anything from, from 10 centimeters up to tens of meters and a time period of two to 20 seconds. It's a turbulent process. And if you don't get turbulence right, you're never going to predict how the wave evolves. Then we've got this aerated swash zone just here. So you've got lots of little tiny bubbles uh, and actually some quite, quite big because you can almost see them in this photograph. And then of course, we've got the sediment here, all these, these tiny, tiny grains. And again, there's a large range of, uh, of scales there. So very similar to what Mathieu was talking about earlier in terms of the range of scales that are in operation uh, of the applications that we're looking to solve, they're enormous. The thing with SBH is, is that, that we can see how to simulate each of these different phenomena. So it's very tantalizing as a method. So yeah, actually we, we, we think we can do it, but the, the time and length scales involved, and we've heard this repeatedly today, are very, very large. So even with this simple uh, scene that some of you might go on holiday to go and play in, okay, we're talking about orders of, of 10 to the power of 10, just in terms of the length scales and then the time scales, order of the power of 10 to the seven. That's the range over which we're operating. So can we do it? Well, of course not. 
Um, not yet. And um, as um, George said earlier, okay, model coupling is basically our only option to, to do that at the moment. Another wicked application that uh, I'm particularly interested in is looking at tsunamis. And this is the destruction that was left in um, Indonesia from the 2004 tsunami. And you can see again, a range of scales and, and difficulties here. This isn't just fluid mechanics now, this is, this is uh, um, material failure and fracture and, and destruction. And then all of this stuff would have been moved around in the tsunami flood wave and then deposited, and that's mixing with this, the, the, the sediment and the water. So a very, very complex uh, problem, but one we have to solve. We have to be able to understand how this, this works. And so really the aim of our, our research is to try and develop the tools to put in the hands of the engineers to help uh, prevent loss of life and destruction in these circumstances. We've done some initial work in this, but we have a, a very long way to go. And then another application is, I, I, I've sort of called it turbo machinery, which you could interpret in lots of different ways, but effectively it's component failure and high speed turbo machinery with lubrication, heat transfer and phase change. Um, so that's quite a difficult problem. And the physics, as you can see in there, is, is not simple. It's basically got all the, all the, the ingredients for a very complex uh, problem. And you might have high speed intersecting mechanical components where you want to understand what's going on in the failure at a very, very small element of the, uh, the, of the domain. So we saw a bit of this from the presentation from Rolls-Royce um, earlier. So this is another wicked application and one that's, that's actually very difficult to solve with, with a, a monolithic method. So I want to sort of remind people of the, the, this is the most common question I receive about SPH. And people say, pointing to the most difficult, most impossible application that they've ever come across in their career or in their industry, they say, can SPH, Jules Physics or Spheric, which is an organization, do this? And of course, the answer is no, but I'm also thinking about funding opportunities in the back of my head. And I said, well, possibly with some, with some development work. Truth is, is that these um, applications are devilishly uh, difficult. So SPH appears to be a method that can solve a lot of things and people see the particles moving. So they, there's a, an intuition with the physics that is going on, a natural intuition. So people might think, well, SPH looks easy, right? So you've got a list of particles. That means it's easy to vectorize. And some, some people refer to it as being embarrassingly parallel. You've got particles that interact with each other with a, with a compact support. That means you can cut off the interaction distance, which is very important. So we don't have long range interaction forces. Um, it's meshless, all right? So we don't have to, to generate any mesh and all those that expense uh, attached to that is avoided. And in general, the formulations are simpler than other computational techniques. So, why aren't things easy and straightforward to implement in SBH? Or why isn't it easy just to add a new module into, into Jules Physics to, 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 um, to solve the problem? Well, there are multiple reasons why, but obviously the number of particles needed for real applications can be very large, even when you've got uh, nested models or you've got variable resolution. So you can't really avoid that. And we can't yet do some of these really large simulations. Then you've got sources and behavior of error. And this is something that may not be a, a, such a concern in astrophysics, but in engineering, it's a huge concern. And we have to be able to demonstrate the safety uh, and aspect basically of the simulation results that we are uh, introducing. And secondly, the physics of the application is some of the most complicated you can, you can think of and you can imagine. And it's sort of beyond you know, simulation techniques as we as we have it at the moment. So that's a, that's a very, very brief uh, um, summary of why it's not easy. And as a, an organization, as a community, SPH has sort of realized this and the Spheric organization, which uh, Stephen mentioned at the beginning, and I've been very fortunate to be involved with for, for many years, uh, came up with a set of grand challenges in order to make sure that SPH can 
provide reliable and robust answers to some of these wicked problems that eventually we will try and solve. So you can see we've got five grand challenges here. We've got convergence, consistency and stability. We've got boundary conditions. We've got adaptivity. We've got coupling to other models. We've got application to industry. We've, we've defined that as being a grand challenge in its, in its own right. Then there are a few others which, which have not been sort of uh, grouped together in that list. You've got the formulation itself. You know, the, the classical formulation actually has some really quite awkward problems when you start to investigate errors. And then you've got multi-phase physics and phase change and all that sort of stuff that goes on, and then turbulence. And this is a, a very difficult topic in its own right that hasn't received a comprehensive investigation in SPH. So these have major consequences for the development of uh, any HPC code for SPH, but particularly for, for a, a, an exascale machine, because the architecture of the exascale machine is going to influence quite strongly how we approach solving some of these problems and implementing them. So this is my final slide, and, and this is sort of what I would sort of set out as being some of the, the, the immediate problems that we face um, for engineering SPH. First is, how do we develop an SPH code to scale at exascale? It's actually not, not at all clear. Um, so, so Professor Richard Bauer, he's leading a, um, a project on this that we're, we're happily part of. Okay, so how do we do it? We actually, we're actually working out how to do that at the moment. The answer is not clear. And as you heard earlier from, um, uh, from our first speaker, the hardware is not yet available. So it's not like we can start to try out these algorithms and, and get an idea for it. Although I'm very pleased to see that's not far away. But then any code has got to scale with the developments of those spheric grand challenges, because if we produce an exascale SPH code, that's great. But if it's useless for engineering, that's not great. So um, we, we actually have to be you know, a little bit smart about how we do that. How we do it, I don't know, but we have to bear it in mind. And then, of course, there's the data structure. And actually, uh, Mathieu started to touch on this during his talk uh, earlier, particularly during the question time. And, and again, that's another issue we have to think about in terms of the architecture. And we saw from uh, Simon McIntosh Smith that actually there's going to be a great range of potential exascale machines. So the, the data structure for those, that we're going to have to think about that. And then much later down the road, you've got portability and energy consumption. And um, I think there was a figure of 30 megawatts uh, quoted for one of the exascale machines. Um, that's not a small electricity bill, and it's not a, school, a small um, carbon um, bill either. Uh, and so we need to, to think about that in terms of what we, we can actually do. So that brings me to the end of what I was wanting to say, and I just thought I'd leave that slide up there as um, uh, something to, to start conversation. Thank you, Ben. That's great. Uh, so, yeah, so any questions for Ben, uh, please do put them in the Q&A. Um, I know uh, Richard has a question on the panel. Uh, but again, any panel members, please do feel free if you have uh, have a question. Oh, somebody's used the hand symbol. Uh, Richard, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, yeah. I'm first? very keen to hear what other people say because I probably asked Ben this before. But how do you, you know, we're gaining a thousand, factor of a thousand in computing power. How do you think that's most useful in engineering? You know, is it longer time scales, higher resolution, more physics, all of the above, or just running the same simulation a thousand times? Uh, well, I think that that would probably depend on a case by case basis, because without doubt, there'll be some problems where the resolution is the most important factor, mm. uh, particularly when you get to things like turbulence and what's going on in terms of uh, wall-bounded turbulent flows, then, then that's got to be important. In other cases, it might be that actually 
you have uh, an optimization problem, such as what Brendan was showing mm. earlier, where you've got a, a very large parameter space and you've got to try and work out what is the, 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 the best route forward. And so I think probably on a case by case basis, uh, of course, that raises some questions about what type of code do we then develop? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's all tricky, isn't it? And what sort of computer you really want, if you wanted to do the same simulation a thousand times, probably you could buy a thousand much more off the shelf computers. Um, I guess that doesn't, you know, then someone will say, I want to do the same simulation that's a bit bigger 500 times and you go, oh, we need a new system. But uh, I think it's something we should very much keep in mind as we're trying to develop code. Yeah, uh, I agree. Matthew, do you want to do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thanks. Actually, it's very it's going to be a very very similar question. I was going to ask uh, is just say that you know about ten to the ten particles is sort of a, a good better scale sized problem. Um, so I was wondering whether if you have exascale, are you going to do? Are we in a position where doing a thousand better scale simulation? varying slightly the initial conditions or, or things like this help us more than doing one single exascale simulation, for instance. And, and I guess your answer is going to be it will be problem dependent. So <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think it would be problem dependent. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, almost, I'm almost fairly sure that it, that it would be. Yeah, it was interesting how Brendan showed problems that were in both camps, right, that both were incredibly complicated and you needed more resolution to do them and at the same time were huge parameter space problem yeah, yeah so well, we want both we want a thousand exascale machines no but my question is also related on in to the sense of you know if you had a thousand simulation of the same thing but with slightly different variations could you use this, you know, do we have the mathematical and, and numerical framework to combine them in a meaningful way to address some of these convergence and um, uh, questions, for instance, and whether that's an orthogonal approach to the whole problem? I, well, I mean, certainly uncertainty quantification and engineering simulations have, has received a lot of attention over the years. And, uh, and actually now there are some quite smart methods to, to, to do that in a, in a much more efficient way, in fact. But I suspect it, that also depends upon the parameter space. I'm not, I, I don't know much about that uh, to be able to answer it. All I know is that actually that field has moved on in quite a sophisticated way um, to, to answer some of those questions, but there's still quite a lot, um, a, a lot of development work that would need to be done, particularly with SPH. Okay. Uh, so there's two questions that have come into the Q&A box. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a bit of a liberty and ask a question myself first. Um, so given that Joule's physics obviously is based around CUDA, uh, tools are starting to sort of show up now uh, to automatically convert uh, NVIDIA code to AMD compatible code. Um, that they're fairly sort of infant, I think that's that's reasonable to say. So my experience so far has been it's quite difficult to just take code and get really good performance. But what would be your preferred way forward if you were targeting exascale systems? One would assume multi GPU sort of applications. Uh, would it be to take what you've done and translate using a tool, or to go to the effort of rewriting in something? More general. It's a, really, it's a really good question because uh, I mean the fact is is that if you want the best performance out of a GPU or a multi GPU approach, then you have to write basically in in the in the, the language that, that's dedicated for that device. So yeah, there's that caveat, but at the same time, I very much welcome these tools that allow a, an easy transfer to uh, another another architecture of course you, you you're going to do it knowing that you're not going to get the full performance uh, out of it uh, it does raise an interesting question of of you know how should we be choosing to develop uh, our software and, and, and new code 
I mean, obviously, when you get a code where people have put in anywhere between five to 10 years worth of development, uh, you know, uh, the developers of that code are going to be slightly reluctant to change what they've done and move to something else all of a sudden, just because a vendor says they should do. So uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think there's a clear sort of uh, storyline, future storyline on it, because I think um, the, the vendors themselves are in competition about uh, which bit of hardware should be used for these future exascale systems. However, I do, I do very much welcome the, the ability to transfer easily between, between the two. So if you've got a translation tool that does that, then that's, uh, that's super. Um, although I've never seen the output of, of what they do exactly. Uh, okay, so um, I asked the two questions. So, so technically speaking, we're in uh, an open discussion part of the, the program now. So um, I think rather than do that, we can just go to the, you know, to ask these two questions and, and answer them, because I think they're quite general. Um, and then if anybody has any more general sort of comments or questions, uh, please do put them to the Q&A uh, whilst we're, we're talking. So uh, Tobias uh, Weintzel uh, has asked, uh, SPH is notoriously unstructured from a data point of view. So um, why do you think it fits particularly well with GPUs, which are best with structured data? Basically, you can produce vectored lists and then just send those to the streaming multiprocessors. Um, that's a simplistic view of it. Um, I mean, the, the fact that you, you do have these multiple streaming multiprocessors and we can create a vectored list allows a much easier uh, way of, of, um, of farming off the, the computations. I mean, I should, I should say, I mean, when, when I answer that question, I'm talking about explicit SPH. When you get to uh, formulations that have an implicit solver in there, that's a lot more difficult because you're having to do that over the, the, the processes inside. So I, I, think, I think that, um, uh, what was the expression used? Uh, why does it fit particularly good to GPUs? Well, I think it fits particularly good in an explicit sense. But once you get to semi-implicit and implicit, I don't think it fits at all. Uh, so, and there are lots of um, open questions on that. So when we're, when we're looking at solving fluids for incompressible flows, and we have a, um, an implicit, we have to do an implicit solution, actually the GPU becomes, uh, it's a challenge, let me put it that way. We've done it, but it's nowhere near as good as the explicit approach. Uh, and the last of the open questions is from uh, George Fatakis, uh, also from Manchester. Um, so do you think with Exascale, we can get rid of models in SPH, for example, turbulence? So in effect, can we use SPH as a DNS? Yeah, I see Mathieu sort of slightly grinning at that question at the same time as me. So um, uh, in an ideal world, yes. <laughs> in an ideal world, yes. I mean, for sure, there are certain applications that will be able to do like a full um, direct numerical uh, simulation, uh, DNS, we'll be able to do it. Um, can we actually resolve the physics of the flow problem in engineering? Uh, well, that's going to depend upon the application. And the size of the domain that we're looking at and in the end we have we we introduce this pragmatism that was mentioned earlier um of, of of coupling models together you can't avoid that and i don't think we'll be able to avoid that in exascale either maybe maybe the other panelists have got a, a different perspective on that but that's my opinion i i agree I, I, in my, there was a topic that Lee uh, touched on at the beginning, which was trying to build constitutive models out of different layers of simulations. I think we will end up using that much more, certainly in astrophysics. Can it handle turbulence? 
Well, maybe we should have another one of these meetings discussing just that topic, right? I think it's too big a topic to do in five, two minutes, right? But I think it's very interesting how far that can go.